reading through the Bible in one year. March 26th, Exodus 37, John 16, Proverbs 13, and Ephesians chapter 6. This is the last of Ephesians today. Let's go on. So now, Bezalel made the Ark of Acacia wood. Its length was two and a half cubits, its width one and a half cubits, and its height one and a half cubits. And he overlaid it with a pure gold inside and out, and made a gold molding for all around it. He cast four rings of gold on, uh, for it on its four feet, even two rings on one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. He made poles of acacia wood, and overlaid them with gold. He put poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to, to carry it. He made a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long uh, and one and a half cubits wide. He made two cherubim of gold. He made them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat, one cherub at the one end and one cherub at the other end. He made the, cherub, the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at the two ends. The cherubim had their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings. With their faces, they faced each other. The faces of the cherubim were toward the mercy seat. Then he made the table of acacia wood, two cubits long and a cubit wide and one and a half cubits high. He overlaid it with pure gold and made a molding for it all around. He made a rim uh, for it a handbreadth all around and made gold molding for its rim all around. He cast four rings for it and put the rings on the four corners that were on its fe- uh, that were on its four feet. Close by the rim were the rings the <clears throat> excuse me and words are hard. The holders for the poles to carry the table. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold to carry the table. He made the utensils which were on the table, its dishes and its pans, its bowls, its jars, with which to pour drink offerings of pure gold. Not that the drink offering is of pure gold, that the the utensils and dishes were gold. Then he made the lampstand of pure gold. He made the lampstand of hammered work. Its base, its shaft, its cups, its bulbs, and its flowers were of one piece with it. There were six branches going out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand from the one side of it, and three branches of the lampstand from the other side of it. Three cups shaped like almond blossoms, a bulb and a flower in one branch, and three cups shaped like almond blossoms, a bulb and a flower in the other branch. So for the six branches going out of the lampstand. In the lampstand, there were four cups shaped like almond blossoms, with its bulbs and its flowers. And a bulb was under the first pair of branches coming out of it, and a bulb under the second pair of branches coming out of it, and a bulb under the third pair of branches coming out of it. For the six branches coming out from the lampstand, their bulbs and their branches were of one piece with it. The whole of it was a single hammered work of pure gold. And you may wonder to yourself, why is this going into so much detail? Why is it so much detail about this very specific thing about how it was made? They don't have pictures. That's literally it. Describe for me the the front door of your house, something you see every single day, right? To somebody who has never seen that front door or even what a front door is. Maybe they live in tents, you don't know. But describe your front your front door to them in detail so they understand all of the parts because all of the parts have a very specific purpose. Go. This is why it's like this. Their bulbs and their branches were of one piece with it. The whole of it was a single hammered work of pure gold. He made its seven lamps with uh, with its snuffers and its trays of pure gold. He made all of it um, and all its utensils from a talent of pure gold. This is extremely heavy. So that's 75 pounds of gold in this one thing. Then he made the altar of incense of acacia wood, a cubit long and a cubit wide, square, and two cubits high. Two, two cubits high. 
Its horns were of one piece with it. He overlaid it with pure gold, its top and its sides all around, and its horns, and he made a gold molding for it all around. He made two golden rings for it, under its molding, on its two sides, on opposite sides, as holders for poles with which to carry it. He made the poles of acacia wood, and overlaid them with pure gold. And he made the anointing holy oil, and the pure fragrant incense of spices, the work of a perfumer. And that's all the notes. All right, let's go on to John chapter 16. All right, let's see here. These things I have spoken to you, so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you, so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning, because I was with you. You didn't have to worry about it then. But also, think about the line at the beginning of this. I have spoken this to you, so that you may be kept from stumbling. Now, for most people... If you start off with a brand new company and you go walking in and, and you get introduced to everybody and things are going well, um, and about a year into it, the CEO comes out and says, oh, yeah, yeah, things are going great. Things are going great. So the SEC is going to come by tomorrow and we're going to be raided and the entire place is going to be um, thrown into chaos and every single person here will be arrested uh, because of the crimes that we've committed against the American people. I told you this so that you may be kept from stumbling. You may be like, what? Maybe I should quit now, right? So that's, that's why he's telling them this, so that they don't quit. So they don't back off. So when things get tough, they don't just walk away from the faith. That's what he's telling them. He's telling them things are going to get really, really bad. Know that they're going to be really bad. Know that it's going to continue to get worse. But also remember that I told you about this ahead of time. And I've been telling you that this is going to happen from the beginning. He didn't tell them that, oh, hey, everything is going to be terrible in the end from the very beginning. Because they didn't need to know that yet. So Jesus continues, But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of, me, none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Because they're finally starting to realize, oh, he's not going to be instantly thrust in as king once he walks into Jerusalem and they and everybody realizes, oh, this is our real king and puts him up and then puts us uh, at both sides of his power so that we can control the entire government and all the people and crush all of our enemies under our feet. Uh, so he's going to die. Got it. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, I don't know why that is. I don't know why he couldn't send the Holy Spirit. If you talk to a modalist, uh, uh, one of the, the oneness Pentecostals, what they'll do is they'll tell you, well, that's simple. Because Jesus cannot both be God on earth and God the Holy Spirit. He is one God in three different forms. We talked about this before. If you sit down at a dinner table to have dinner table with God, you only need to set one setting for God when he comes. And he'll come either in the form of the Father or in the form of Jesus the Christ, uh, the human form, or in the form of the Holy Spirit. That's oneness Pentecostals, and that's modalism. That's also heresy, because it lies about the character and nature of God as he's described himself. So we know that the Holy Spirit is a different personage, a different person from Jesus the Christ, who is a different person from God the Father. We know this to be true because Scripture tells us these things. But there's some sort of a, an order in which Jesus the Christ has to leave 
to send the Holy Spirit to us. I don't know why that is. I'm not God. I'm not going to presume as to why that would be. I can speculate, but my speculations are just the things inside my own head and largely worthless. All right. So what he says is that he um, will not, sorry, the helper will not come unless Jesus goes and that he will send the helper, which is the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness in judgment. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the Holy Spirit has three main roles. The first one is conviction of sin. The second one is instruction for, um, for new Christians, right? That, that's the process of, uh, during our conversion to teach us about the things of God. That's the convicting of sin. The, the second is um, the process of sanctification, right? So that as we are a, um, a new creation in Christ, the Holy Spirit works within us to bolster our conscience so that we are tender toward our own sin and the sins of others to keep ourselves away from it. So then we can be like David and run from evil and don't even allow somebody who sins to be near us because we don't want to be... Um, uh, tempted to follow after what they're doing, right? And then the third one is he is our seal and our guarantee. Because we have the Holy Spirit living within us, we know that what God says is true because we aren't just, you know, reading through the text or, or hearing a pastor preach a sermon and go, man, I sure hope that's real. Because we have the Holy Spirit living within us, so we know these things to be true. So when we read in the New Testament— about the fact that we know um, that God is true and that what he says is true because of the Holy Spirit within us that, that calls out to these things so that we know that it's accurate. And also, oh yeah, we have God living within us that proves that God exists and proves what Jesus said about him is true right here. Then we can know that these things are true. So let's go on. So the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Let's go over those. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. So he's now here to represent the righteousness of God to us. And three, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been, past tense, judged. And I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. Same as Jesus reflected God the Father to, to those who were there. So now the Holy Spirit reflects Jesus the Christ to us. For he will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it, uh, yeah, and he will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. A little longer, a little while, and you will uh, no longer see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Some of his disciples then said to one another, what? Oh, hold on. What is this thing he's telling us? A little while and you won't see me, and then a little while and you will. And because I go to the Father. So they were saying, well, what is this that he says, a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to question him, and he said to them. So they hadn't actually said it out loud yet, uh, or at least not to him. Are you deliberating together about this, that I said, a little while and you will not see me, and again, a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, 
She no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy from you. In that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, remember what we said about name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be full. These things I have spoken to you in the in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that um, I will request of the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you. And because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world and am leaving the world again and going back to the Father. His disciples said, Lo, now you are speaking plainly and you are not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this, we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These, these, that, sorry, these things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Bring up the notes here. All right, there we go. And let's go on to Proverbs chapter 13. Buckle up tomorrow. We're finally going through the high priestly prayer. I've been referring to this for a long time. But if you don't know it, just know that it's good. That's all you got to know. Well, I mean, you got to know the thing, but we're going to get there. All right, let's begin. A wise son. Oh, and briefly. Uh, so, um, again, we're going through Proverbs. We're finally in the section. Uh, one through nine is talking about um, how the, uh, sorry, the, their, their longer uh, pericopes on Proverbs. Um, instead of it being like it is here, where you have uh, one verse as its own uh, contained proverb, um, one through nine covers most, sorry, the, the, not really most, they're the, the longer paragraphs or longer thoughts that in some cases encompass the entire chapter on one single idea in a proverb. Here in chapters 10 through uh, the end of 22, so up to 23, uh, we're in this section where it's just little tiny um, proverbs one after another for each verse, but they're all in a theme. So the theme of chapters 11 sorry, 10, 11, 12, and now 13, is a contrast of the upright and the wicked. So a wise son accepts his father's discipline, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. From the fruit of a man's mouth, he enjoys good, but the desire of the treacherous is violence. The one who guards his mouth preserves his life. The one who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the soul of the diligent is made fat. A righteous man hates falsehood, but a wicked man acts disgustingly and shamefully. Righteousness guards the way, rather, righteousness guards the one whose way is blameless, but wickedness subverts the sinner. There is one who pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, but has great wealth. The ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but the poor hears no rebuke. 
the land, sorry, the light of the right. <laughs> I'm, I'm going back to my ESV. I, I've read that thing so much. My brain just shorts to that one. So the light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked goes out. Through insolence comes nothing but strife, but wisdom is with those who receive counsel. Wealth obtained by fraud dwindles, but the one who gathers by labor increases it. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. The one who despises the word will be in debt to it, but the one who fears the commandment will be rewarded. The teaching of the wise is a, a fountain of life to turn aside from the snares of death. Good understanding produces favor, but the way of the treacherous is hard. Every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool displays folly. A wicked messenger falls into adversity, but a faithful envoy brings healing. Poverty and shame will come to him who neglects discipline, but he who regards reproof will be honored. Desire is real, or rather, desire realized is sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination to fools to turn away from evil. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Adversity pursues sinners, but the righteous will be rewarded with prosperity. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Abundant food is in the fallow ground of the poor, but it is swept away by injustice. He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. It is enough to satisfy his appetite. Rather, the righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the stomach of the wicked is in need. All right, that's it for today. <clears throat> Let's go on to Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, let's go on. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Not by way of eye service, as, as men-pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, that he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters, do the same things to them, and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Finally, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, 
against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the, day, sorry, in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, uh, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. This doesn't mean in tongues, it means you know, properly. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. That in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. But that you know, rather, but that you also may know about my circumstances and how I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. I have sent him uh, to you for this very purpose, so that you may know about us, and that he may take uh, comfort, rather, in, and that he may comfort your hearts. <laughs> He's not going to take their comfort away from them. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Behold the word of the Lord.